Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, wherever in the world you are watching this from. Um, tonight, yeah, I'll be talking about guests of the Sultan, Allied prisoners in Turkish hands. And uh, as Ian said, it'll be roughly around an hour long, with hopefully plenty of time at the end for any questions um, and answers. So we're we'll looking at uh, this subject in four different ways. So initially, um, what I'm phrasing sort of take no prisoners, you know, the myths and reality of being captured in 1915 in Gallipoli. Um, then start looking at the capture and interrogation process and examining some of the stories of the men who were there. Um, third part is then looking at life in captivity, you know, what is it like and uh, discussing everything from hard labour, women, yes, women and Raki. So some interesting stories there to get into the, uh, the talk. And lastly, finishing with the home run with a few stories of escape and repatriation. So um, sort of moving on, what got me interested in, in POWs, and I think it's probably a boyhood love of films, actually not just a boyhood lover, you know, I still love movies today, not just military movies, but a variety of different types. And uh, I've just put up onto the screen now um, various uh, 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 movies um, based on prisoners of war. Some really good, I can recommend, some absolutely atrocious. Um, put your eyes to the bottom right, the three-pack action um, by Chuck Norris. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily go out of your way to watch that one, but some great movies there, Great Escape, um, Bridge of the River Kwai, Midnight Express, not military, but um, gives you flavour to um, um, Turkish prisons um, during the 1960s, I think, and other films like All the King's Men, which um, follows the Fifth Norfolk's um, and uh, their demise and their capture for some of them um, during one of the attacks at Suvla in August 1915. A lot of these films probably give you some sort of background to, um, you know, possibly some of the atrocities that, you know, have happened, you know, e either before or after capture, you know, some of the Nazi atrocities during World War II come to mind, um, execution of British prisoners, Canadian prisoners in, in 1940 on the retreat to Dunkirk or Normandy. Um, in 1944, where lots of Canadians were shot, or US troops in the Battle of the Bulge and atrocities there. Um, in the Far East, some atrocious conditions there. Um, and that really takes the biscuit, the biscuit I think, in cruelty to um, servicemen. But it also happens on the other side as well. Um, in World War II in 1940, I was doing some research quite recently into um, guardsmen who were um, retreating back to uh, uh, Dunkirk initially, who actually executed several Belgian um, citizens. So there's some interesting stories there on both sides. Um, looking at the First World War, um, and we often sort of mix First World War with the Second World War, um, and sort of taint, rightly or wrongly, and I'll be talking about this um, in this talk about how the Turks treated Allied prisoners of war. And there's especially there's some ill treatment at places like the Fall of Kut in 1916 um, that sort of gives rise to, you know, a lot of this um, sort of uh, misinformation sometimes on um, treatment of allied prisoners of war. And when I say allied, including the whole range, you know, not just Britain, British Commonwealth, Indian Army, um, but also the French as well in that. Right, um, let's, uh, let's uh, flick on. So um, after the war, according to a report, which is actually titled Report on the Treatment of Prisoners of War, published in 1918, it was determined that just over 16,000 British and Dominion servicemen were believed captured, emphasise the words, believed captured by the Turks. Roughly around 13,000 of those were taken in Kut alone. Of those, about 5,500 are known to have died. Around 1,000 wounded soldiers were actually exchanged or repatriated before the end of the war. I'll come back to that a little bit later. However, at Gallipoli, uh, my research has shown there's roughly or exactly at the moment, but the number does increase, 
I've got the names of 30 officers and 460 other ranks, NCOs and privates. And that's really 3% three per, three of um, casualties, it's a bigger pardon, that's 3% of what Turkey, Johnny Turk, captured for the whole of the First World War. But I think, you know, I find that fact quite amazing that such a high proportion of soldiers died at Gallipoli, but very, very few prisoners, and that is worryingly low. So we'll have a look at that and uh, talk about that as we go along. Um, first of all, captivity was something that no one really wanted to risk. And there's propaganda stories of German atrocities in 1914, 1915. Many were unfounded with little or no evidence to say they actually happened. And the same goes for Turkey as well. Today, we sort of refer to this as fake news. You get headlines in the press at the time, um, quote, Belgium child's hands cut off by Germans or Germans crucify Canadian officer. And a lot of this, I think, are designed to develop and strengthen the hatred of the enemy at the time and useful tools to fuel recruitment, etc. And on the flip side of that, looking at some of the German newspapers at the time, you know, they report on um, French doctors infecting German wells with plague germs or German prisoners blinded by allied captors and things like that. So they were using exactly the same propaganda techniques, I think, to um, help with uh, recruitment. And guess what? The same was basically said of the Turks. You know, we were accusing them of poisoning wells, blinding and torturing killing prisoners. Um, there's a report of um, Dublin Fusiliers on V Beach um, being found burnt and mutilated with their eyes gorged out. You know, sorry for the graphic details tonight, um, but that is what it was reported at the time in the newspapers. You know, how much of that is torture or how much of that is the effects of modern weaponry? Um, um, two soldiers who may have got too far in the advance got uh, cut off within the village, within houses, and, uh, um, and burnt to death after houses have been shelled. Um, this story on the screen at the moment is um, from a New Zealand experience, and again, it sort of touches on that Dublin Fusilier story and some other stories as well. Fake news, propaganda, truth, you know, who knows at the moment. I think what we need to do with Gallipoli and we often see this sort of modern I'm um, not sure how to phrase it like a, a huggy kitty type view of the relationship between the Turks and particularly the Anzacs um, about how friendly they were and how it was a live and let live and to quote uh, Dr Christopher Pugsley um, famous um, New Zealand historian he said that is total bullshit from all the research he found is they were fighting each other tooth and nail virtually all of the time, and they rarely miss an opportunity to kill or maim your enemy. Um, and of course, that was happening on both sides. But there were quiet moments where there was a live and let live, and there's evidence there at Anzac. There's evidence, particularly in the French sector, and also the British sector later on in the campaign. Um, it's quite shocking, some of the evidence I found uh, from Lieutenant Frank Yeo. He was in the Royal Naval Air Service, part of the Armoured Car Detachment, and he wrote a letter just after the close of the Battle of Gully Ravine in June 1915. And uh, quote, he said, have just been up to our front trench. The sights are too ghastly for words. The place is covered with dead and wounded. I found a Turkish officer, Shamin, he was hurt. I felt inclined to shoot him before he shot some of our men. The Tommies were furious. I had an awful job to save his life. Chief Petty Officer Sharkey, one of Yeo's men, had a slightly different attitude. And he was based up at Anzac later on in the campaign, um, actually later on, just after the landings. On the 28th of April, he wrote in his diary, the Turks are doing a lot of dirty work, such as killing our wounded and cutting up our dead but we can play the same game and by, and by orders, no prisoners are taken. And he underlines that. On May the 1st in his diary, he writes, no quarter is shown here either as the Turks from the start did dirk, dirty work and the Australians and Marines are paying them back using their own coin. 
strict orders have been issued that no prisoners are to be taken, so everybody is shot. At the top of the gully on the road down to the beach stands a sergeant major who examines all stretchers as wounded are being carried down. And if the being is a German or a Turk, the order rings out, drop it, stand clear, and immediately there's a sharp report and a wounded man is a dead man. 22nd of May, he moves down to the Hellis sector where the British and French were. I treated myself to a shave, he wrote, the first since the landing. The Turks made a desperate attack, but we were driven back, leaving 500 dead. Um, sorry, they were driven back, leaving 500 dead and wounded in front of our position. Also, a few prisoners who never reached the beach. And it goes on and on and on. There's few diaries, I think, as candid as Sharkey in his view towards taking captives, but you know, he certainly was not alone with that. Men on both sides were driven to probably near madness by the sights they witnessed and saw nothing wrong with taking out their frustrations on the enemy, um, if not taunting them, you know, torturing them or killing them. And I've seen evidence on both sides for that. So who were the first to be captured at Gallipoli? Um, the first recording I could find actually goes to the French. And if I had a dollar for every time saying, did the French fight at Gallipoli? I'll be a very rich man by now. Um, the photograph on the screen, I think that is the French submarine, the Sapphire, that in uh, early January, 15th of January 1915, it became the first submarine to try and break through into the Sea of Marmara. Um, it sort of hit, hit the curb, it got grounded, um, which isn't a good idea for a submarine, especially when it gets grounded under the guns of a, uh, a Turkish fort. Um, to actually give credit to the submarine, it did pass all 10 lines of mines in the Dardanelles before running into trouble. Um, the Turks fired onto the submarine, killed 14, captured, th oh, sorry, killed 14, captured 13. And the uh, Sapphire, I think, became one of three, possibly four French submarines um, that were lost um, trying to force a way through the Dardanelles. In total, I've got the names of um, 85 French servicemen who were captured, 60 being sailors, predominantly from the submarines, and 25 soldiers. More subs, so really the not so silent service. Um, this is a photograph of um, the British submarine E-15 that uh, um, was under the command of Commander Theodore Brodie, um, who became, became the first commander and uh, British submarine to pass or, or try to pass through the Dardanelles, the attempt failed. It grounded as well under the Dardanelles battery. Um, the Turks shelled the submarine, killing uh, seven of the crew, crew including Commander Brody, who was in the conning tower at the time. The others died who were actually inside the submarine. It sounded like salt water probably um, um, contaminated the um, um, the uh, batteries and uh, caused chlorine poisoning for those trapped um, where the batteries were inside the submarine. The remainder, however, became uh, prisoners of war. And this is embarrassing for the British, not so much the prisoners of war, but losing what was you know, quite a modern submarine at the time. And they went through some extraordinary lengths to try and destroy it. And as you can see from that photograph on the top right, they didn't do a good job at it. And there's uh, Turkish naval personnel, there's press, tourists, etc., looking and examining the submarine in great detail there. The British tried to destroy it by battleship um, from um, outside the Dardanelles. They actually sent planes to try and bomb it. Um, eventually, it was torpedoed, not by another submarine, not by a plane, but actually by a wooden picket boat. And uh, Lieutenant Commander Eric Robinson um, gained a very worthy VC for that, where he um, basically uh, steamed his or, or rowed up the Dardanelles, which is quite a feat against that current. And um, between two boats, uh, first torpedo miss, second torpedo hit, and did enough damage to destroy it. The first submarine to actually succeed in passing through the Dardanelles goes to the Australian submarine AE-2, which got through in the night of the 24th, 25th of April, just as the landings were happening at Hellis and Anzac. However, on the 29th of April, it was torpedoed. Um, big upon it, it was actually spotted by um, a Turkish torpedo boot, boat, 
damaged, um, possibly damaged, um, but eventually led to the commander, Henry Hugh Stoker, you can see there on the left of the screen, to scuttle the boat. Um, Stoker, for those who don't know, um, is uh, related to the Bram Stoker family from the um, famed Dracula story. And he became um, one of the first Australian um, prisoners of war, although I think his ancestry is Irish. Um, you can see here some uh, French colonial troops uh, probably landing at uh, Kumkali on the Asian side. 21 were captured during the first day, first, second day, 25th, 26th of April. Um, same goes for Australians at Anzac, who lost at least four men, or at least we know the names of at least four men who um, advanced too far inland, became wounded, lost, and, um, and or became prisoner of war. So four go into the bad that we know about. We know at least two cases of prisoners later on in the Gallipoli campaign that basically ventured the wrong way down the trench. So it's not necessarily in combat all the time, taking rations up to the trench, and especially later on in the campaign, lots of trenches were shared. They were captured from the Turks, a barricade goes up, Brits, Anzacs on one side, Turks on the other. And if that barricade goes and you go the wrong way, you can quite easily become captured. Um, back to the first stage of the landings, um, many more was, were captured than those numbers. Um, at Anzac, several men were captured that I know of that were not actually recorded by Charles Bean, the official historian. So I've got those names listed down as well. Many had been captured, and um, we're thinking probably 20, 30, possibly more, that were taken to um, a hospital in the town, small town of Maidos, which is now Eshabat. And unfortunately, the hospital was um, shelled or bombed by the Royal Naval and Royal Naval Air Service, which set fire to the hospital. And tragically, um, a lot of the wounded were, were actually killed. A lot of those wounded were not just Turks, they were, they were British um, and um, Anzacs as well. And unfortunately, those names we don't know. And they become, I suppose, part of the memorial to the missing we have on the peninsula today. One of those that was captured, and this is an interesting story, is Vivian Brook, um, 12th Battalion, Australian. And um, he was originally from Tasmanian civil life. He was a cashier in the bank, as many of them were. You know, sort of uh, think about these big strap, strap in bronze Australian lands, New Zealand lands, for working on the farms. But a huge majority were clerks in banks, insurance companies, in shops and things like that. Brook himself was wounded on the first day, um, captured probably in and around White's Gully um, up at Anzac during one of the Turkish counterattacks. Wounded, the Turks take him away and sort of care for him, you know, actually care for him in one of the hospitals on the other side of the Dardanelles. Um, I think he's or pr pretty sure he was actually in this hospital when it was shelled by the Royal Navy. And um, we have... Um, um, a, a letter which is in the Australian War Memorial from another Australian soldier, and I can't think of his name at the moment, but he wrote about Brooke, about being operated on, and he said, I saw about, sorry, I saw him referring to Brooke about two hours after he had been wounded and was with him until he died at Bega, where we both had been in Bullock wagons. Bega is around 40 kilometres east of Chanakli, for those who know the area. He was barely unconscious most of the time and was buried in the Christian cemetery. So he had not only been wounded in combat um, at Anzac, he was unfortunately wounded mortally um, by the Royal Navy, who of course didn't know there was a hospital there and he died of his wounds. Today, he was actually buried in Ari Banu Cemetery at Anzac. I think he's the only POW I know who's actually buried on the battlefield today. Talk about the first day he has this wonderful story here of Edgar Allen, um, Edgar Adams, and um, he was an 8th Battalion guy, and there's a lot of intrigue about him. Um, young lad, he had a brother as well, I believe. Um, 18 year old, landed on the first day, Anzac Day, 25th of April, and sort of disappeared. He was last seen in the late afternoon. Um, and so many of the Australian and New Zealand troops got so far ahead of. Um, their, their positions they were trying to consolidate, they either got lost, became wounded or killed um, in the valleys and the, um, you know, the ridges, scrub covered. Um, so, you know, sometimes a good mile from the actual battle itself, they had advanced a long, long way. 
What is quite interesting about this story is that note you can see on the left and a bit difficult to read actually says, am prisoner about two miles from where we landed between the dry lake and the other, ERC Adams, 8th AIF. And what's interesting about this note is it actually washed up in Alexandria in Egypt later on in 1915. Now, I'm not studying currents. Um, I'm not trying to be sceptical, but um, I suppose that is possible, unless it was a joke by you know, one of his mates, which doesn't necessarily seem the right thing to do. So there's a big investigation done by the British Red Cross at the time who wrote to the Turkish Red Crescent, which is the equivalent of the Red Cross, and they still exist today, to find if there's any knowledge of him. Talking about the dry lake, it sounds very much like Suvla. And of course, from Anzac, you can see that dry lake. Where would you take your prisoners? You'd take them north of Anzac, away from the battlefield and over to the Dardanelles, where there would be boats to take them north. So very possibly, he was um, a prisoner of war. Possibly, he died somewhere between being captured and um, the inquiry going off to the Red Cross. We will never probably know that true story, but um, amazing nevertheless. We have the story now of Fred Ashton, 11th Battalion, another Australian who was an office clerk in civil life. Um, he was captured, um, he was a medic, he was captured wound, um, bandaging up a wounded Kiwi on Baby 700. Um, Ashton actually wrote in his report after the war, quote, about the wounded Kiwi, he said he was in terrible agony and asked me to finish him off. I told him to lie still while I went and sought a stretcher bearer. But when I looked around me, I could see no sign of our former firing line, nor could I see anyone. They seemed to have vanished completely. So all of his men had pulled back. And those who know the story of Baby 700, that dominant, pretty strategic um, sort of vital ground in terms of a, you know, you know, a military position changed hands five times on the first day he was left behind and he was captured in the valley and became a prisoner of war. What's quite interesting, I'll just read about um, his interrogation. And um, he talks about uh, being interrogated in a Turkish HQ. He doesn't say where, but he says, I was taken into a tent and interrogated by some Turkish officers um, who who, who actually talked to, to some other officers at the time who gave the job up as hopeless and sent for another officer who could speak about four words of English. They produce a big map of Egypt, the Suez Canal and the Dardanelles and, and made me try to understand that they wished me to tell them how long it had taken me to come from Egypt and also if I'd been in Cairo, Lemnos or Mudros. Amongst my papers was a money order from Australia drawn on the post office at Cairo. And when they saw that, they knew I'd been invading the truth. So they ceased to question me, given, so they ceased questioning me, given the job up as hopeless. One of the officers signed to me to follow him and I went into his tent where he provided me with a two course meal, after which I was sent into his orderly's tent and was given an old Turkish great coat to sleep under. After I had been asleep for some hours, I was woken up and taken outside the tent and found three more Australians outside. Now, these Australians we now know to be three officers, Captain MacDonald, Lieutenant Alston and Private Lushington. Big pardon, last one's a private. Ashton continued in his diary, he wrote, in the morning, we were marched to another Turkish headquarters where we were given some boiled eggs and bread for breakfast. And from there, we were taken to a seaport. After the examination, we were taken to an empty house and placed in a small room where we were given a meal and then taken to another room furnished with two beds. At this place, we received exactly the same treatment as the officers. Our battalion colour patches have apparently misled the Turks to our rank. However, you may to leave in his diary, um, reading his diary, that they then realised that he wasn't an officer and then separated to go to another ranks camp. Interesting photograph there, and there you can see um, um, the two officers, Captain MacDonald and Elston there in that photograph in the middle. I'm not sure who the other gentlemen are. I think one's French. I'm not sure the one on the right hand side. But uh, MacDonald, um, first name Ronald MacDonald, so no jokes, please. Um, 
is an interesting story and they were part of the 16th battalion AIF um, commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Pope. Now they realized or they believed according to the orders that um, the Anzacs which was rightfully so were going to meet up with the Gurkhas um, who they believed were um, going to advance from the south at Hellis. So they sent forward uh, Macdonald, Elston and Private Lushington. Now they sent Lushington forward because he was born in India and, and was a speaker of Hindustani at the time. So he went forward thinking that they were Indian troops, but they were Turkish troops. So you can imagine this almost comical conversation as they're trying to speak Hindustani to the Turks. The Turks are trying to speak back in, uh, um, in a Turkish and none of them really realised what was going on. Now comes forward Lieutenant Colonel um, Pope, who realizes that, hang on a minute, these look like Turks, drops back down the valley and very lucky to not be captured on the first day of the landings. It would have been embarrassing having the uh, Colonel taken. What was not so good was Captain MacDonald had in his haversack not only the landing plans, other secret maps but also what the objectives were of the Anzacs. It'd be interesting to find out how much the Turks did use of that intelligence. So a great big call for them. And there you got Pope on the left hand side. He, he actually survived that and uh, um, a, a courageous man served for the remainder of the campaign. The biggest haul at Gallipoli was during the August offensive both, both at Suvla, Anzac and Hellas. And we have um, the story of Lieutenant Colonel Henry Moore, East York's officer, Pioneer Battalion, um, who basically advanced too far. And what he's seen in this photograph is the, um, the British side of uh, Tepe Tepe, which is one of the objectives for the Suvla landing. And that is perched on the very top of Tepe Tepe. You can see a couple of phone masts there, comms masts. That's the village of um, uh, Little Anafata, which is behind those hills. So they got pretty, pretty close. And it's roughly this position where they ran into Turkish reserves um, around the 8th, I think, 8th, 9th of August, um, 1915. They tried to do a fight and retreat, got surrounded, and the Turks captured the whole of um, HQ Company and a large portion of D Company at the time of the East Yorks. Lieutenant John Still, I think Margaret was referring to his book earlier, which is highly recommended, hasn't got much on Gallipoli, but a great account in terms of his life as a POW, wrote, of those taken with me, one was not molested, one was fired at from five yards distance, missed and quietly captured, one was beaten and fired at. Thank God the man who fired at him hit the man who was beating him and broke his wrist. The fourth, my colonel, was bayoneted, and for the moment, the fury ceased. He did not seem to suffer any pain at all, only to be intensely thirsty. He drank the whole of the contents of my water bottle, of his water bottle, as well as my own. They even allowed me to carry him on, him, on my back, and on my back, the colonel died. May he rest in peace. He was a brave man and a good friend of me. And that's a quote from the um, A Prison of Turkey by John Steele. Moore is buried today in uh, Green Hill Cemetery, along with Major Brunner, um, whose Royal Engineer is attached and uh, part of that attack. Still goes on to write, we, we, we began to experience that strange mix, mixture of nature, so characteristic of the Turks, from which we and our fellows were to suffer much in the years to come. The man who took my possessions searched my pockets and annexed anything and everything military. He took my purse and saw that it contained five sovereigns in gold, more than I have, have, have ever since owned, and a good deal in silver. Then he gave it back to me and apparently told me to keep it. The pay of a Turkish private is, or was, 10 piastres a month, about one shilling and eight pence. My Turk, my, sorry, my capture was a good Turk later on when I came to know how rare good Turks were. So a little bit scathing there of the Turks, but it shows you the mix of good and um, potentially bad ones. Um, where they find a lot of the violence was not necessarily with the frontline troops, again, in the red mist and fighting, um, you know, sort of tooth and nail in, 
in trenches all sorts happen but uh, where a lot of the um maltreatment seems to happen is behind the lines in sort of reserve units and those who may not be fit enough to um, fight in the front line you get a lot of evidence of that um, on hill 971 where the australians were attacked um, there was um, a great diary which is in the australian war memorial from a guy called patrick o'connor who's in the 14th aif and uh, i just want to read his account of his capture he said, shortly afterwards, I saw a Turk coming towards me through the bushes at my rear. I closed my eyes and pretended to be asleep. The Turk touched me with, with his foot. Then he unbuttoned my tunic and saw a money belt that I was wearing. Apparently, he was unable to see how it unbuckled, for he seized hold of it and bumped me up and down until it snapped. The process gave me intense pain. The Turks took the belt away, gaining around eight pounds, and left me. Another, talk, um, another Turk came along shortly afterwards and went through my pockets. He got a few cards and letters, but missed my watch, which I had strapped into the Havelock tobacco tin. As soon as I was wounded, I had worked off my equipment, hiding the water bottle in the bush within easy reach of me. The second Turk emptied the bully beef out of my haversack, but did not take them away. <laughs> it's quite, quite ironic that even the Turks knew the bully beef wasn't uh, uh, up to standard. And that Turk left him. He then wrote, a third Turk came along. He was luckier than his predecessor, for he found my watch and also robbed me of my wing, of, of, of the ring I was wearing. Seeing that I was awake and conscious, he signed to me to come along to him. I signed back that I couldn't walk and that I wanted a stretcher. I was, sp I was sparring for time, thinking that the longer I could keep him there, the better chance I would have of being picked up by some of our own fellows. However, he too eventually went away and never came back. Within 10 minutes, another Turk came along. On his way to me, he had to pass a number of other Australian wounded. I saw the brute draw a bayonet from the scabbard of a wounded Australian and then thrust, thrust it into the wounded man's stomach. I yelled out to him. I could stand it no longer. He heard me all right. I cursed him in good old Australian. When he came forward towards me, I first pretended to be asleep, but he soon made it clear that he had heard me speak. He picked up a four pound lump of rock that lay near me. Holding it in his hand, he began to pound my head with it. When I raised my hands to fend the blows off my head, he transferred his attentions to my body around the ribs. Eventually, he battered me, to, uh, battered me until I lost consciousness. When I came to, there was a party of four or five Turks near me. They were talking loudly and rapidly, and it was their voices that woke me up. They signed to me to follow them, but when they found that I was helpless, they seized hold of my hands and began hauling me down low towards the ground into the gully near me. My idea was that they intended to take me down there to do me in proper and then strip me. But an officer suddenly appeared, accompanied by a Turkish orderly, the latter carrying a rifle. I think the officer was a German. He certainly was not a Turk. As soon as they saw the officer, they dropped me and started to run away. But when the officer called them, they came back again, and the Turkish orderly covered them with his rifle. As the officer's orders, at the officer's orders, the Turks packed me up and carried me to him. He did not speak English, but I heard him say hospital, and I was handed over to the care of the armed orderly. So a very lucky estate, escape for O'Connor. Um, also during the August offensive, and not far from here, um, the 1st 5th Norfolk's um, had a lot of men captured on the 12th of August. And uh, this is sort of famed in the, um, um, the, um, 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 the book, which I cannot remember now, um, um, about the Norfolks and the Sandringham Company, which is wrong. They weren't a Sandringham Company during uh, the Gallipoli campaign. That was far before. But they had two officers captured. Um, there were actually more down on the list, but um, they didn't make it to um, the POW camp. So again, it's one of those, we don't know what happened to them. Were they killed by friendly fire? It's one of the most dangerous places to be on the battlefield being taken off of it? Could they be murdered by some unsavoury Turk? Did they just die of their wounds later and buried in the field grave that 
any sort of marker has now been lost. You know, bearing that that is probably the least things on their minds when there's a battle going on. But a wonderful photograph here of, um, um, what have we got there? We've got an Indian on the left hand side, actually a Gurkha, and he, he's a rifleman Grom. So luckily we can translate that and we know their names. And he was captured down in Cape Ellis in May 1915, probably during the capture of uh, Gurkha Bluff. We've got a Frenchman there, second to the left, which is uh, Michel Antoine, who's in the 4th Colonial Regiment and captured that Hellas in June 1915. He's actually been a veteran of the uh, fighting in France in 1914. William Allen there is the Australian in the middle, 9th Battalion, captured on the 28th of June. Fortunately, he was in a die of illness later on in 1916 in the prison of war camp. Then we've got Maurice Del Pratt, um, 5th Australian Light Horse there, um, four for long from the left, captured again on the 28th of June. And lastly on the right from this, one of the Zouave Regiment is Amélie Georges, um, who's captured in um, on the 22nd of June. Um, June was a big date for the fighting at Carreau's Fair Dera, um, so some big battles for the French there. But they all survived the battlefield they managed to get captured none of them look really too badly wounded and care for the turks then in their um, um camps the interrogation stage is quite interesting um and what's quite lucky for us today is a lot of the uh papers are still available and in the um turkish um um, general staff archives in Istanbul or Ankara and there's a book published that's been translated into English so that is obtainable as well for people who are interested in that. I've just pulled out a couple, one from a private Reagan, um, Connaught Rangers, who was captured at Hill 60 in uh, August 1915 and he said, uh, and, and, these, and these are quite brief, he just wrote, so the Turkish interrogator wrote, he does not know anything He's an illiterate person, even his speech is incomprehensible. So I'm just wondering how much that the Turks could understand or maybe a strong Irish or regional accent. Um, you get a quite a few like that. Um, Private James from 32nd Field Ambulance, um, they write of him, he is trying to confuse us by not telling us anything, which is, uh, which is interesting. He's not uh, telling him anything, he's not necessarily confusing them. <laughs> and a Cornelius Bird from the East Yorks, captured with more, we saw in, in the earlier photographs. And, now, he wrote quite glowingly of the Turks, saying, I do not have any complaints about the Turks. And the same goes for Private Scott, who says, I've seen no maltreatment from the Turks to complain about at all. So some interesting um, interrogation um, reports there. Of course, you wouldn't necessarily um, talk ill of your capture um, whilst you're that side of the wire. Um, it's probably worth pointing out, and this is quite interesting, because Lieutenant Lushcombe, um, an Australian who was with O'Connor, um, who's his, actually his platoon officer, was interrogated by none than other, Limon von Sanders, or, or that's what he, he wrote in his account. He says, um, uh, as required by the terms of the Geneva Convention, I answer questions concerning my name, rank and regiment without hesitation. I then politely refused to answer any further questions. After further attempts by the interpreter to gain more information from me, I was agreeably surprised to find that General von Sanders respected my refusal to answer further questions. He ordered the Turkish interpreter to desist from asking further questions, and I was taken back to the tent which I had just left. And that goes on when he interviews then Lieutenant Steele, who wrote that book from the East Yorks. But not all of them were. I suppose kept their lips closed and absolutely a fantastic photograph here. Um, um, I have used it sort of once before and it's from a good friend um, who lives in Istanbul who managed to find this in Turkey um, in the equivalent of like an antiques um, market, junk market. And what's quite lucky is we can name not only the Australians in that photograph, there's one with the bandage on his arm who's an officer, and um, two uh, soldiers sitting down, but also the majority of the Turks in that photograph. Now, the officer with the bandaged right arm is Stanley Jordan, uh, Second Lieutenant Stanley Jordan, 9th AIF. 
Um, and he was an accountant, only 21 at the time, from Cos Harbour in New South Wales. He was captured during the 28th of June 1915 up at Anzac, where there's an attack on Sniper's Ridge to draw um, Turkish tank um, attention away from the battles of Gully Ravine. He doesn't necessarily keep a full diary, but what is quite interesting is a diary kept by a private Creedon, and Daniel Creedon there is photographed. I think he's the one in the middle there with the moustache and the droopy looking hat. And by the right of him is a William Allen, um, who appears in one of the earlier photographs I've just shown. But I'll just paraphrase what um, Creedon said. Um, and this is sort of going through the interrogation where both the private soldiers did not give any information away. However, Jordan seemed to give quite a lot of information away. He not only answered questions where there was water, where the boats were coming from. He also answered questions if the trenches were covered or not, where the gun positions were, what time the trenches were relieved. Creedon then said he stood up and said stop answering and the officer said how dare you or something to along those lines I will answer any questions I wish and then they separated the officer from the private and um, carried on I think probably not necessarily interrogating him in the bad sense of the word just asking, asking him open questions and what's quite interesting is um, Jordan himself writes home about Johnny Turk and his experiences later on in July 1915. And his experience is, I'm in a Turkish internment camp somewhere in Asia Minor. I'm quite well and my arm is almost better. I'm with a lot of other officers and there are some from the submarine E-15 and also some from the Australian submarine AE-2. We also have French and Russians here with us and we form a lively entente. I'm learning Turkish and French languages. A submarine officer teaches me Turkish. A French officer teaches me French. I'm living really well, but it's a crazy old life. I study most of the day and play chess or bridge at night. It was hard luck being captured within seven weeks of getting a commission, as it did not give me a chance, but I did my bit and I'm now tied up till the end of the war. The Turkish officials are exceedingly kind and courteous. For most of the time, I'm at their headquarters in Constantinople, where I'm treated more as a guest than a prisoner. Or may, maybe you want to argue, maybe because he's a little bit loose-lipped, I think is the World War II uh, um, saying, but um, he was definitely um, blamming away a lot of information. Interesting, Jordan, he gets fully promoted whilst a prisoner of war, and there's nothing I can see in his papers after the war to sort of discredit anything he did. However, Creedon, who unfortunately did not survive. He died as a prisoner of war in 1917. What we do have is his diary, and he was very, very scathing of that. And if you want to read the full account, um, it's available in the Australian War Memorial, and I can give you the link to that. Getting off to the battlefield, really, really important. And uh, that was probably one of the most dangerous places to be after the capture, because you're hardly likely, to, if not to get wounded again, um, to get killed by either friendly or enemy fire. But typically you are taken off by mule, by horse, as you can see in that photograph, and it looks like um, I'm a Turkish wounded soldier in this photograph. Um, the, the Red Crescent, the medical um, guys would do their best for you, and um, you'd then be sort of taken from the battlefield to the ports. And of course, the ports we're talking about are probably on the Dardanelles side of the, almost definitely on the Dardanelles side of Gallipoli, where you would then sort of have your slow boat to Constantinople. Um, Patrick O'Connor, um, you know, he, you know, he, he, he actually writes in his diary about that um, trip, and uh, it wasn't a nice trip for him. He was in a, a, a cart, and of course, the roads out there, you know a lot better today than they ever been. But if you go on one of the dirt tracks, and of course it would have been like that, in an old cart, two-wheel cart being pulled by um, um, a, a cow or, 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 or a donkey or a horse is going to be very uncomfortable if you have got a wound. And he was very scathing in his remarks. But typically the, the, um, the treatment of the allied wounded was just as good as the treatment of the Turkish wounded by the Turkish medical staff and those working with them. So that's actually good. 
one of the dangers I'm talking about getting off of the battlefield, um, I'm just going to quote from O'Connor now, he says, um, the little steamer almost immediately pulled out from the pier. The reason was clear. Our aeroplanes were bombing a village nearby and one had started a fire there. The authorities were evidently afraid that the Turks might take panic and rush the steamer to escape. So they pulled her out from the pier. There were still two of our wounded comrades left on the pier. And when a vessel pulled out, I thought that that would be the last we would see of them. But to our great surprise, later on that evening, they were brought alongside in the rowing boat and taken aboard. The steamer then carried us off to Istanbul. Um, and I'm just wondering how much of that was these hospitals that had wounded in there that maybe British, Australian, New Zealand, French wounded were actually killed um, by friendly fire as opposed to enemy fire at the time. See a great German postcard there, photograph of um, allied wounded, um, captured Englanders um, in the medical facilities um, somewhere, probably on their way to Istanbul. Constantinople as it was. The hospitals themselves were looked after um, and mainly men, especially amongst the, the senior medical staff, um, the senior nurses and the, uh, the doctors and surgeons by a heavy mix of Austrians, Germans, um, Turkish as well, Greeks and Armenian doctors. So it's quite interesting that a lot were still um, looking after both um, their, their own side and also the allied side as well and there are pretty good doctors from the accounts I've seen um, just quoting from, from, from O'Connor's book again and um, he you know he talks about a German sister um, examining his leg because he had a really really bad wound in there and sort of going to as he called him his Pasha doctor um, who the nurse called over, the German nurse called over to actually uh, look at his leg. Um, um, unfortunately, it had to be um, um, amputated, um, but, but they did it in a nice, clean way. So he actually survived. And um, he actually mentions that the nurse instructed him to um, be fed with a nice fresh cutlet and eggs in the morning. So they did treat him really well, and as well as they were treating their Turkish wounded at the same time. Um, we now have a wonderful photograph. This was only sent to me fairly recently by, by a friend over in Turkey who's actually you know, come across this photograph. And this is interesting historically because what it does show is a mix of British and definitely Australian prisoners in there. There's around 120 men in that photograph. Officers at the front, you can see about seven or eight there, and NCOs um, in order down to privates at the back of that photograph. And they're being paraded outside what used to be the ministry, the Ottoman Ministry of War. Today, it is a university. And um, um, Lieutenant John Still was one of those. And I can't, haven't actually quite worked out which one he is in that photograph, but he would be one of the officers at the front. I just need a little bit of time. And I think I can probably identify most of the officers definitely and possibly some of the NCOs. But he, he actually writes about being paraded in this square and it must have been the time this photograph was taken and I say why was he said we're outside the ministry and we're passed um, before a cinema a cinematograph I think, I think it means a cinema you know cinema camera I do not remember how many times we circled round this infernal machine while the operator was grinding the handle but it was a good many times by the time he'd exhausted the role of the film, we must have been a very credible appearance. Several divisions it must have looked like going past this camera. And what we have today, managed to um, sort of do my best to do a then and now. And you can probably see on the right hand side towards the trees, that sort of white tower. If I just go back a bit, and there it is on the right hand side. And there you have the ministry building, or what used to be the ministry building, which is now the um, university in uh, Istanbul. So, what was camp like? Camp life like? So, you wouldn't going to, you weren't going to necessarily going to stay in Istanbul the whole time. You're going to be interrogated then and sent to work camps. As you heard from Jordan, the officers had a good life. They weren't permitted by the Geneva Convention to work. However, the other ranks were. And this is a camp, I believe this is um, Hafion Kara Hissar, 
or like Hafion as it was um, abbreviated, was one of the largest prisoner of war camps during the Gallipoli and uh, later part of the war. And it became a bit of a distribution centre where they would all be collected together and then pushed out to other parts of um, um, Turkey. A lot were used there for labour um, when they left the camp for working on the Berlin-Baghdad railway. Um, some were pushed down to Smyrna around Izmir. Um, some in this area, you know, you were at you know, some of the great mountain ranges in Turkey, um, some reaching 3,000, 4,000 feet, and you were 200, 300 miles from the sea, so pretty secure in terms of... Um, um, preventing any chance to escape because literally you are in the middle of nowhere in the middle of a desert so some big camps other big camps were, were Kiangri and Changri as well which um, were mainly um, camps for other ranks but officers did turn up great um, sort of painting there which was um, sent in by uh, I'm one of the members of the Glippy Association, and you have there on the left-hand side, Sidney Lawrence, our private Sidney Lawrence, and a painting of himself. So he survived his um, um, ordeal with the Turks. He was part of the 4th Worcester Regiment, captured during a battle near the vineyard, near the vineyard in August, 6th of August, 1915, as part of the 29th Division attack, just north of uh, Krifia Nulla. And he went in the bag with most of X company. So an awful lot of Worcester men got cut off in a forward trench. The Turks managed to get around them and bag the vast majority of them. So he was very lucky to survive that. Um, in his account, he has um, um, a wonderful uh, account. And this is where the painting comes from of a Turkish officer um, struck in him, striking him with the sword, not with the sharp end, with the blunt end of the sword to um, make him walk faster. Now, Sydney at the time knew a little bit of Turkish and he swore back at him, both in Turkish and then in English. He said, then the Turkish officer got off of his horse and Sydney thought that was it, he was about to kill him. But the officer shook his hand and apologized saying he didn't realize he was English because he was so suntanned, he thought Sydney was a native. Now, it sort of gives you an indication to maybe there's a bit of racism or sort of hierarchy within the Ottoman army, um, as was with the British army at the time. And I think this sort of goes, goes, to, um, goes with some evidence to how they treated particularly the Indian prisoners that were captured at Kut, which is a talk for another day. It was a long walk to a lot of these camps. Some walks over 100 kilometers, 200 kilometers to these camps, and many of the wounded did not make it that far. And I think this adds to some of the missing names we just can't find, we can't track down. We know they're missing, we know they're believed to be POWs, but they haven't a known grave. The Turkish Red Crescent don't know their names down, and of course the British Red Cross haven't got a note of them either. Talking about working um, in some pretty hospitable places around Turkey, um, there was lots of work um, putting down the line for the Berlin Baghdad railway, um, using explosives to blow out tunnels. As you can see, a railway tunnel there at the end through these mountainous regions. Um, many died of exposure, many died of wounds, maybe festering wounds from uh, um, um, action at Gallipoli. Um, others died by simple things like rock falls or, or um, explosions of tunnels where explosives were incorrectly set. Um, many suffered emotional breakdowns um, as well as physical, in, in, um, physical injuries. And uh, again, these are quite difficult to list. What you can do is uh, pick up a lot of this from diaries of some of the other POWs. One sad story in May 1916 is of Leonard New a 15th AF soldier who had um, so far survived and was pretty healthy, but he was killed in his bed. And when a boulder just rolled down the mountainside and it just happened to just go through the middle of his barracks roof and killed him outright. Um, New, um, I think he was 22 when he died. He was originally from Beckenham in Kent, but went out to Australia for a better life. But he is one that was buried. Um, First of all, in the Christian cemetery in Benedict, and now moved to Haida Pasha Cemetery, I believe. Um, no, bigger point, I don't think his uh, grave was found, so he's now on the uh, 
Baghdad, um, the Northgate War Memorial in Iraq, where a lot of the prisoners who have not got known names um, have been commemorated. There's an amazing photograph there of um, Afyon, and you can see that sort of mountain. Um, I think it translates to black opium, and um, traditionally it was an area where they were growing the um, poppy. And there's a castle there today, and it's in the middle of nowhere. And little has changed, but a lot of prisoners were um, stationed um, uh, you know, into that area. Um, they weren't, you know, from the research, I could find no regime of systematic abuse by, you know, by the Turkish prison or war system at all. But of course, you get individuals. There's rarely you find anyone sort of routinely tortured or intentionally starved, unless it's for punishment and things like that. Some were deprived of Red Cross parcels. Yes, they were getting sent out to Turkey. Um, some weren't getting money. But on the flip side of that, others were receiving money regularly from home. They must have opened these envelopes. And, you know, the trustworthy Turks did leave the money in those and they reached the prisoners of war. Lots of help were given, though, by the ambassadors, the Dutch and American ambassadors in Turkey, who did really a lot of good work in ensuring that they were well looked after or as well looked after as can be. Um, because the treatment or life for a Turk is different probably to someone from the Western world. So sometimes you read about um, the poor food, but it was probably poor food to an English or Australian New Zealand standard, but it wasn't necessarily poor food to a Turk because that's what they were eating every day. Um, there's one horrible account, and I won't read this because um, it is pretty horrific, um, of someone called Maslum Bey, who was a commandant of Afyan Kara, the camp um, not too far from here. And he appears in quite a few diaries and uh, he, he, he was absolutely horrid man. And, uh, um, but he has his, you know, he has his end where at the end of the war, um, he gets court martialed by, by um, the Turks themselves, because they come to understand how horrific and his treatment was of um, allied prisoners of war. And actually British soldiers bravely gave evidence against him. And this was still while the war was going on, I have to hasten to add. Um, um, he was sentenced to five and a half months imprisonment in Turkey, not the six months that maybe he should have got, because if he had got six months, the Turkish system, he would have lost his rank. So the judges were a little bit lenient on him. However, after the war, a bit like the Nazi um, hunts that were going on um, in Germany after 1945 and all over Europe, they, the British did track him down and imprisoned him in Malta. Um, and uh, I forgot how the story ends with him. I believe he um, gets let off at the end, but you know, maybe you know, he should have been hung for the war crimes he committed. And I can uh, give you some books. John Steele's book is a good one if you want to know more about him. We sort of touched on conditions a bit. For officers, they were much better, you know, much better than those of the other ranks. You hear about Jordan, you know, learning two different languages. You know, he's playing bridge and uh, cards and chess and things in the evening. Um, in the evening, the officers were given more opportunities to venture out unguarded. I hasten to add, there was a trust system there with them. Officers tended to receive more money from home. Um, there's actually accounts of officers writing checks made out to cash to take to Ottoman banks, and believe it or not, they were honoured. They actually gave the money, and uh, it's amazing that uh, during during war that this was still happening. Um, also, because they had money, they were able to supplement their rations um, probably more regularly than a lot of the other ranks, and they were excused from work. The chief occupation, um, let's say, sorry, not occupation, preoccupation as a prisoner, be it an officer or another rank are probably the same the world over. You know, one is food, it's never going to be great. Boredom is going to be there probably in the top three. Women, <laughs> and probably homesickness as well in there. Now men captured at Gallipoli certainly suffered from all of these, but it was only really only the latter that they were not able to find a solution for. That's and what the latter, I mean homesickness. Food especially 
was a major preoccupation, um, preoccupation of the troops. Turkish rations were poor. There was not really enough money to sacrifice the men's hunger. However, thanks to a lot of the money being received by the American and Dutch ambassadors, they were able to supplement their rations, other ranks as well as officers. The men typically pulled their money together. So what they would do then is go out to town with more money individually and try and get food for the whole camp or those who are putting in money. Um, they were allowed to sometimes also unguarded, allowed to go into towns. Um, they could purchase bread, fruit, vegetables, and meat if it was available. However, they were strictly not allowed to buy alcohol. However, did it stop them? No. There's many stories I found in diaries of wine, cognac, Turkish Raki being purchased as well and smuggled back into the camp. I just want to read you a bit of a humorous um, diary quote from a Lance Corporal George Kerr. Um, and there's been a book published um, in Australia um, with his diary, which again is uh, worth um, getting hold of. And uh, it's about some, you know, some of the men's uh, sort of lust for women. And quote, he said, there was a woman in the town who does it. There are several from that matter. A woman named Madame Sophia and her daughter are not very sensitive about taking money. Only the daughter wants too much. Johnny was with Madame Sophia for a dollar yesterday, but he tells me he was with a girl of about 19. That would be her daughter, who would want more than that. Perhaps Johnny's imagination has helped him a little too much. A man will always make out that his girl or the like, is a lot better than she really is. In reference to the foregoing, I must say that we never expected to get much liquor in the town, nor did we ever dream of any of us would be able to sleep with a woman. So I find that absolutely amazing that um, that was allowed and permitted, but the Turks did allow them out to do that. And of course, homesickness, you're never going to cure that. So what did some of the guys do? try to escape. Now I've mentioned before sometimes you're two to three hundred miles away from the coast so it's quite a jaunt to actually try and get to the coast maybe steal a boat and then if you weren't captured by the Turks trying to get back to friendly lines either back to where the British were or maybe one of the Greek islands off of the coast in the eastern Aegean. One of those who um, did try twice is our friend Lieutenant Commander Stoker there you can see him in the white shirt in the middle um, with a, a tailored tash and uh, beard there standing up in his uh, white shirt and trousers. He tried twice, got captured, recaptured twice. Um, once, allegedly, he tried to escape, escape dressed as a woman. Um, I'm not sure what he did with the beard, but um, that didn't work. It was not convincing at all. Talking about um, the Turks and how they treated him is you'd have thought he would probably get um, a bad beating. And uh, yes, he did, but um, and got thrown into a jail in Constantinople, into just a general prisoner's jail as well, not in one reserve for prisoners of war. So pretty horrific uh, um, um, prison um, conditions there in Constantinople. The colleague he did try to escape with and almost got there was a chap called Godfrey Fitzgerald. I can't think which one he is in that photograph um, on E-15. So one of the other submarines, Stoker AE-2, the Australian submarine. Um, when they got recaptured, um, I think this is in early 1916, word was received that the English were actually maltreating the Turkish prisoners in Egypt. So both Stoker and Fitzgerald were confined to prison for 11 days and given a miserable damp dungeon in what was the old war office building at the time. When the news of the alleged maltreatment of the Turkish prisoners in Egypt was received, lots was drawing, lots were drawn amongst the prisoners to see who or should be taken to Constantinople to be imprisoned for this for a, a reprisal. Now Stoker and Fitzgerald drew the unlucky numbers and were the ones selected for this some um, extra sort of bad treatment. However, after the intervention of Enver Pasha, um, we're actually encouraged to send a neutral doctor and officer to examine the Turkish prisoners in Egypt. They actually found that 
it was untrue. The British were not treating the Turkish prisoners um, in a bad way. As some sort of thank you then, um, or sort of apology rather, to Stoker and Fitzgerald, um, they were released from prison. They were put up into a five-star luxury hotel in Constantinople. They were given five pounds each to spend in the city, being guarded on, on the honour of an officer that they would return to the camp. Um, I think it's quite miraculous or quite, quite amazing that this would happen at a time of war. Um, what's also interesting, what happened directly after this event, and, uh, and frankly, you know, lots of thanks, I think, goes to the intervention of the American ambassador, um, um, was Fitzgerald was repatriated later on in 1916 back to England as an extended apology for this repri rep reprisal type um, treatment. Um, now, what is quite interesting is Fitzgerald was going to get married to his sweetheart and the Turks knew about this. So they actually said to him that if, they, if Fitzgerald gave his word of honor not to fight against Turkey anymore, they would release him back to the British. He gave him that honour, he was released back, returned to England later on in 1916, and in all the best traditions of the British Navy, stuck to his word and didn't fight the Turks again. Then we have some bizarre stories, a very quick one here, which I haven't sort of fully researched yet, but his papers are, are available in the Australian War Memorial is um, a private SAS who allegedly escaped um, from a POW camp. However, there are no records of him actually being in any POW camp. So is it a, sensation, a sensational story of a venture or is he a bit of a rogue? Because when you look at where he was stationed, the Australian Army uh, records are pretty good. Even though he did land on Gallipoli, during the time he said he escaped, he was actually in a hospital in Egypt. Well, that's what I truly believe. So this is one, I think, for a little bit more research. Camp life itself, this is a typical camp. And really, because these camps were so remote, the, the grave is probably arguably the only means of escape or wait it out for the end of the war. And it's quite sad to read that... Um, Though, you know, a few died from misadventure in the camps, you know, quite a few did die of disease. And these weren't just the prisoners, these were the Turks as well. So you can't necessarily say that was due to, you know, poor or maltreatment. I can account for 137 British and Dominion servicemen who were captured at Gallipoli that died after being admitted into, a, into the POW system. And about a and that's about a third of those that were taken in total. So quite a high number, you're talking about 30, 33% um, died um, that side of the wire, leaving two thirds to uh, um, be returned. Well, they're saying that out of the two thirds to return, four died pretty quickly after through illness. Um, and these I'm just referring to are the Gallipoli prisoners, not those from other theatres. Um, that were captured by the Turks, because I think we know that a lot of the Indian troops at Kut were um, quite poorly treated and died. So and there's um, one of the uh, um, um, graves um, originally out in uh, one of the prisoner war camps, I forget which one that is, and um, some of those names are actually lost. They're on the memorials to the missing Others are reburied into the Haida Pasha Cemetery in Istanbul today. By early 1918, um, a number of Allied prisoners were con considered unfit, actually, um, and were repatriated from Turkey back to their home countries. And one of these was Patrick O'Connor, who I've read a couple of times from his diary and was to lose his leg. And he got home in 1917 actually to a hero's welcome. Those who were left behind were not released from Turkey until November 1918, and they would not actually be home in Britain, in Australia, New Zealand, Canada, wherever, until early 1919. However, their homecomings were not to be like O'Connor's. There would be no glory, um, there would be no 
flags coming out for these guys coming back later. The Australians, New Zealanders, the British, etc., and the French had already uh, welcomed back the returning soldiers from this four-year war, um, not just fighting Turkey, but elsewhere in the world. So it's quite sad that a lot of these didn't have parades and uh, sort, of di sort of disappeared back into society. To sum up the talk um, today is uh, a report I want to quote from about the treatment of British prisoners of war in Turkey. And I think it sums up a lot about the Turkish treatment of um, allied prisoners. Quote, the history of British prisoners of war in Turkey has faithfully reflected the peculiarities of the Turkish character. Some of these at any rate to the distant spectator are sufficiently picturesque. Others are due to the mere dead weight of the Asiatic indifference and inertia. Others again are actively and resolutely barbarous. Bar barbarous. It has thus happened that at the same moment there has been prisoners treated with almost theatrical politeness and consideration. Other prisoners have been left to starve and die through simple neglect and incompetence, and some prisoners driven and tormented like beasts. These violent inconsistencies make it very difficult to give a coherent and general account of the experience of our men. Almost any unqualified statement can be contradicted again and again by undoubted facts. And the whole subject seems often to be ruled by nothing but pure chance. I just want to caveat that, that that is you know, a reflection of um, Turkish treatment at the early part of the 20th century, um, you know, different to uh, uh, Turkey today. To summarise, officers were treated on the whole better. Other ranks treated worse and they had to work. And a lot of the deaths you see are predominantly from the other ranks or from those that were badly wounded and didn't receive or, 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 or there wasn't the medical treatment available at that time to um, um, bring them back to good health. There was forced labour on the Baghdad railway, as we've sort of touched on, but that's not dissimilar to elsewhere. You know, Germans use Allied prisoners on the battlefront in the Western Front. Russians use German prisoners to build the Murmansk railway, where there's reports of over 25,000 German prisoners dying out of the 70,000 captured. So huge, huge casualty figures. The slide here, you're looking at um, um, the North Gate, uh, um, or what's left to it, the North Gate Memorial, which is in uh, Baghdad, Iraq today. And this has the names of the POWs that are missing. Those that are buried, um, that have known graves, were pulled together, collected together from all over Turkey and the Middle East. And they now lie in a beautiful cemetery in Haida Pasha um, in I was to say Constantinople in Istanbul today and it's a beautiful place because it's not far away that sort of red tile building behind is part of the Scutari barracks where of course Florence Nightingale um, served during the Crimean War where Britain and France ironically were allies with Turkey fighting against Russia and it's also a stone's throw away from here that Colonel Doughty Wiley those who know him of the VC fame at V Beach where his wife worked, Lillian um, Doughty Riley, not Gertrude Bell, before the war as part of the Red Crescent. Um, but again, that's a story for another day. So thank you very much for listening. And I think we now have some time for some questions. Uh, okay, thank you, Stephen, for <coughs> a fascinating talk. Um, as usual, um, meticulously researched, um, with tremendous resources, including uh, testimonies from many serving soldiers. Um, uh, really interesting stories, individual stories, as well as, as always, uh, the big picture, the context. And, and always, as always, again, delivered with your usual aplomb. So uh, I enjoyed that tremendously. Um, Thank you, Ian. You're, you're so kind. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, any questions? There aren't any on the chat at the moment. Um, any questions? So, I'll um, have some gulps of water whilst uh, sure. people are asking or thinking about questions. Ian, can I, 
can I ask Stephen a question about at a, at a Gallipoli conference in Birmingham about the second one, there was a very old man there who got up and said his father was a prisoner of war uh, um, and he, he'd had some medical training <laughs> and he'd helped another prisoner. Can you recall that story? Yes, I believe that's Arthur Coxon. Um, and that was his father. Yes. Um, you know, sadly, Arthur's no longer with us, but um, yeah, he's a yeah, long running member of the Glippy Association. And uh, I'm, I'm not sure what happened to his scrap album, but he had a fantastic scrap album with, with like, the stubs from his checkbook where he used to sign checks in the prison of war camp. And he used to put whatever it was at the time, £10 sterling. It was taken to the banks, the Turkish banks, who then give him the cash. Um, but I believe he honoured all of those and paid them back later. So, um, yeah, amazing story, an amazing gentleman. You know, he's you know, never actually met his uh, father, who was a POW, but his uh, son, who was a ripe old age at the time, was fantastic to talk to. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Can I ask a question, Ian? Yes. Hi, Steve. It's uh, Mike. Oh, hi, Mike. Hi, hi. Th thanks. Really entertaining talk. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, particularly like the bit about uh, prisoners' comforts, you know, I thought that was very entertaining. Oh, Madam um, Sophia, is it? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, uh, as, as you know, um, the, the 42nd Division um, held uh, Gully Spur from sort of middle of August until virtually the end of December. Uh, during that time, there were probably about 10... Um, Turkish prisoners who walk through the beach barricade uh, and the, you know there's fa fairly good records kept on them e even sort of names and ranks etc um, but I haven't seen in all the diaries one reference to a British soldier going the other way first of all I want, would like to know if you've heard of any uh, not, not just in the 42nd division uh, but anybody at held, mm -hmm. and, and also, um, what happened to those Turkish prisoners uh, once they'd, you know, what was their journey? Where did they end up? No, some good questions, Mike. Um, so the so the first one um, from the Turkish side, there there are quite a few accounts. You're right, you know, forty second div and other diaries as well of Turkish prisoners, let's say Ottoman soldiers coming into British lines to give themselves up what the the pre, predominantly they seem to be not necessarily turkish regular soldiers but soldiers from elsewhere in the ottoman empire where so, soldiers from syria and things like that i think probably were having probably a hard time the turkish side of the trench um and saw an opportunity to come over to the british and one of the reasons why quite a few turkish prisoners or ottoman prisoners or soldiers tried to get across to the British lines and many were successful was again through, I suppose, a bit of propaganda that we were dropping leaflets via aircraft. We were putting propaganda leaflets inside of shells to shower down onto the Turkish trenches saying, we'll give you money, we'll give you food, we'll give you blankets if you come across to the British side. And it sounds like that was partially successful. What I haven't seen is, is a list of those prisoners i'm not sure if it's still in some archive somewhere because a lot of those turkish prisoners captured at gallipoli you know elsewhere in the middle east some got back to i think it's the isle of man um where was a where, where there was a turkish prince of a war camp there and one day i'd like to go across there and have a look at this um because i think there's still some remains and there's some things in the local archives which are probably worth exploring but i don't know if anyone else knows i haven't seen a complete list of turkish prisoners of war the place I would probably look at is the um, Turkish Red Crescent to see what was shared with the British Red Cross because I would imagine they would be doing the same things putting the Turkish names back to the Turkish Red Crescent as they were doing vice versa via the Red Cross. Um, from the if I understood your question right Mike is from the British going the other way the only stories I've seen um, through the diaries that still exist are of men not being captured in combat but those just getting lost in the trenches you can imagine Helis, Suvla, Anzac 
you know, it could be dark early morning. Um, as you know, there's a lot of trenches there with barricades in between that got washed away. They take up the rations in the morning they're not necessarily familiar with the area and they take the wrong turn and they find themselves in a turkish trench and especially at subra i've seen that three times now around asmak Deri, um, which is a particularly flat area with a mishmash of trenches i haven't seen any accounts around krifia nul and helis if that happened but i wouldn't be surprised um, i think that needs a little bit more research um, unfortunately we don't have a lot of those records available we're relying on diaries and you know, if anyone knows of any POW diaries out there that mention other prisoners, we can somehow, you know, we can try and plot these, sort of patch these stories together to try and get a fuller picture of what went on a hundred and, what is it now, six years ago um, at Gallipoli. Okay. Hopefully that's answered your question. Yes, um, thanks. Okay, good. Um, a few questions now on the chat from Warren Smith. Thank you, Stephen, very interesting. Earlier on in the talk, you mentioned Stanley Jordan and his capture along with Daniel Creeden. Could you explain why there were Russians there? Yes. Um, so there weren't Russians at Gallipoli, but in the POW camps there were. The Turks were fighting um, the Russians around the Caucasus, um, which sounds a bit of a dodgy area to be fighting the Russians, um, but in that sort of northeast part of, of uh, Turkey. And... Uh, um, lots of Turkish soldiers were captured, lots of um, uh, Russian soldiers were captured as well. The officers would typically go into the officer camps where I think, was it, was it the Russian? Yes, he was talking, um, he was teaching Jordan how to speak Russian, I think, and uh, um, others were taking, taking Turkish lessons, some were taking French lessons, etc. In the... Um, man's camp the ncos and other ranks there were also russian prisoners as well and not dissimilar to world war ii they tend to be kept separate in separate barracks to the british and dominion prisoners at the time yeah. um, okay thank you uh, from karen dennis uh, thanks steve for delivering such a uh, a well-researched and interesting talk um from michael uh, Llewellyn Smith, I'd like to ask about what happened after the war concerning the repatriation of prisoners. Was there a negotiated exchange or what? How did it work? Uh, October, I think it's October the, the 30th, um, 1918, um, there's a peace treaty uh, signed with Turkey with the Allies. So the, as part of that, the first prisoners are released from the camps, which is probably around November 1918 onwards. So, of course, you had to allow for those communications to get through to the camps that um, now the war is over. Uh, the Red Cross got involved and, of course, referred to the American and Dutch um, um, ambassadors in Turkey, who did a really good job as well, sort of caring for those prisoners. And they also helped with the extraction out of the camps then, which of course was peaceful, using Turkish army guards to protect them. Because of course, Turkey after the war was sort of going into the civil war sort of sort of part, um, the war of independence, the Republican war, um, to get those troops back to the coast onto boats and then is taken to um, safe islands um, where the British were. And in October 1918, I think it's the end of October 1918, just going back to the campaign, British land on V Beach, completely different to April the 25th, 1918, where we land, we come ashore, and the, the British um, um, occupy Turkey until 1923, I think, part of the occupation forces. But all prisoners were, were back um, in Allied hands in November 1918, and majority back in the UK, New Zealand, Australia, Canada, wherever they're, they're being repatriated to by the early stages of 1919. Okay, thanks. Um, another one. Thank you, Stephen. Great talk. Could we have the names of some of the books you mentioned or maybe perhaps a bibliography? Um, yes, yes, I can put this, you know, feel free to reach out to me afterwards. Um, my Glyphy Association email address is uh, historian at glipley-association.org. Um, one I recommend is John Still called A Prisoner in Turkey, 
Margaret, have you still got that to hand? I just wonder if you could put that to screen. Um, and there we go, A Prisoner in Turkey, and that's thoroughly recommended. Uh, he wrote it, um, it's sort of based on his diary at the time. You can get it quite cheap now. If, if you want the original book, it's quite a collectible book and it's quite expensive, but you can get it on Amazon, I think, for and other good booksellers for a reasonable amount of money. Um, but that's great. There's around 14 pages about the attack at Suvla, about him going forward with um, the East Yorks and getting surrounded and captured. But to get the experience of a POW from an officer's point of view, that's thoroughly recommended. Um, there's another one by Private Kerr, an Australian, which is recommended as well. That got published, I think, around the time of the centenary and is really good from like a soldier's point of view, a private's point of view, what it would have been like uh, working in, uh, you know, working on the Baghdad Railway um, and some of those working parties deep in um, Anatolia. Okay, uh, a comment from Ellie Seymour. Arthur Cox's father was a dentist. I recall him telling me his That's father it. had Harrods food parcels sent to him. <laughs> But obviously, Fortnum and Masons weren't delivering to Turkey at that no, time. No, 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 stop. <laughs> very disappointing, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, uh, comment from uh, Steve. Thanks, and another Steve. Thanks, Steve, for a fascinating talk. Got an interest such a relatively high proportion of prisoners from the Gallipoli campaign survived to return home. Seemed in stark contrast to the numbers of men who survived captivity from food. I presume that was part due to the fact that many were badly emaciated following the siege and forced to march hundreds of miles across hard, harsh terrain, terrain, sorry, terrain, <laughs> to reach the work camps. Here's Steve Snelling. Oh, Mr. Snelling. Yes, there's, um, yeah, that's a really good point, actually. They, they did have a longer distance. Um, they didn't have the slow boat to Cairo or the slow boat to Constantinople. Um, which was quite fortunate for those captured in Gallipoli. All the records I could see, they went by boat. They didn't have to march. Marching over, over the deserts um, um, in Mesopotamia, as it was, yeah, would have been pretty horrendous, um, even with good kits, uh, water and food. And uh, those wounded, yeah, were uh, singled out and left to die in the desert where they probably still are today. There's also, I haven't done a lot into Kut recently, but from memory, um, a lot of the guards weren't actually Turkish guards, they were Arab guards. So again, which we tend to taint the Turks, I think, during World War I with a lot of mistreatment, maltreatment of the prisoners. But, um, you know, going back to the Turkish army, they were much, much bigger, big, big empire at the time. There seemed to be a lot of the mistreatment were from their Arab regiments at the time who were... Um, pretty vicious on the prisoners, especially the Muslim prisoners, which, so it wasn't just those who were non-Muslim, Hindu, etc. but um, that is probably one I'm not strong in at the moment, but it'd be interesting to do some research into how they treated the Muslim prisoners of war from the Indian armies at the time, and that's something, um, yeah, I'd like to know a little bit more about, but I can't, you know, I'm not sort of learned to reply on that today in any great detail. Okay. Some, I'm, I'm another book here very, very quickly. Um, and again, fly my own flag here. But uh, there was a great book brought out a few years ago, um, edited by Reese Crawley and Michael Cicero, called Gallipoli, New Perspectives yes. of the Mediterranean okay. Expeditionary Force. So the chapter I did was, funny enough, on POWs, which is the basis of the talk tonight. That's it. Uh, thank you, Mr. Crane. Um, it's, um, it's not cheap. But it's a big book. It's got quite a few hundred pages with different stories from different historians, academics and things um, who've got interest in Gallipoli. And I've got a slightly fuller chapter there on Gallipoli POWs, if you want to read any more. Hey, thank you. And uh, last of all, absolutely fascinating talk. Many thanks again, Steve and Ian, for organising. Um, no, you're welcome. That's a great pleasure. Um, a couple of things from me before I say a final thank you to Stephen. Um, we do these talks monthly um, on the last Tuesday of uh, the month. Um, the next one, I'll explain why it's the, the next monthly one strictly, April the 27th, um, 13th, the 13th Western Division at Gallipoli, Mesopotamia and 
do. And that's done by Paul Knight, very good speaker who has uh, contributed to conferences. The reason why we're not having one in March is that we have a, um, a, a conference ourselves um, uh, over two days. And I'll just try and share my screen for you, um, if you don't mind. So that the technology works. Um, there we are. Don't ask why it's stuck on the uh, um, stuck on an American uh, talk on the American presidents. Uh -huh. All right, there we are. Yeah, it's on the website as well. So yes. um, if, you, if you're not familiar with the Glip Association website, have a look at the yeah. events page and there's some more details there as well. Saturday the 20th of March, uh, two sessions in the morning. We felt that four sessions on Zoom was a bit much. And then Tuesday evening, 23rd of March uh, as well. Um, you have to pay for this one and pay in advance. Uh, if you don't pay in advance, you don't get the link. Um, so, um, and then we have, of course, uh, Stephen uh, and the uh, Phillips, sorry. You've got oh, three, the, what, I'm talking about the three presidents? Yes, the three US <laughs> presidents. Uh, so I'll, I'll stop sharing there before my... Uh, <laughs> it's a good job I didn't tack it on to any, uh, anything dubious, wasn't it? That's yeah, a, yeah, yeah. a talk I'm doing in the U3A about, uh, yeah. about three US presidents. I thought I'd just stick that one on there. Anyway, as uh, Stephen says, that's on the website as well, and it'll be it's great. It's on it. Uh, so, um, yes, some of you have already uh, uh, registered. Some of you have already paid, which is great. Um, these talks come completely free. We have um, uh, for you, um, uh, and uh, we have uh, historians of Stevens Kaliba giving their time free. And uh, so, if you would, if you are not a member of the Gallipoli Association, if you'd like to make a donation, it's remarkably easy. Uh, you can donate in different currencies as well, um, and uh, that would be great because um, the Gallipoli Association is a members, uh, a membership-based charity. Uh, so, funds the more funds we have, the more things we can put on. Um, so, um, but the even better than donating will be to uh, join the Gallipoli Association. And you, won't, you won't then be feel guilty if you don't make a donation um, because uh, members get these talk free. Um, okay, so. Um, can I also add in there as um, you know, we've got such a good audience tonight is, um, mm -hmm. you know, you know, again, it's, you know, you, do, you don't have to donate, but if you can, you know, for example, donate your time or if you've got some information about Gallipoli you think could be useful that we could use on the website or maybe for a future conference or um, if you're in one of the regions of the UK or anywhere in the world really and you think you could help the Gallipoli Association, help promote us or help us in the research, you know, please, um, you know, feel free to come forward and uh, we've got a growing um, group of um, people all across the globe, you know, helping out in different ways, and uh, it makes us strong. And again, to Ian's words, there, you know, with more money and with resource, we can do so much more as an association. And uh, you know, we're, we're always there trying to uh, punch above our weight. So uh, long may it continue. Okay. So thank you for your support. Uh, so if I can then finally thank Stephen once again for a fantastic presentation. I know how long these talks take to prepare and um, and also giving up his time freely uh, for your entertainment on another lockdown Tuesday. Uh, so you can either turn off, um, uh, you can either unmute and applaud and cheer, or you can put a symbol on uh, from the reaction. So thank you very much, Stephen. Very good. Thank you all. <laughs> okay. So... Um, this is a weird experience here, seeing all these little boxes <laughs> clapping. <Yes. laughs>